It's kind of nice. It's the first time I ever got to listen to Simeon preach. <laughs> He's been listening. I don't know, how many hours of my preaching have you had to listen to in your whole life? It's Hundreds. probably been a bunch. <laughs> anyway, so it's good to see everybody here. Um, this is kind of day two of a conference for us. And um, so I'm going to cover some new material. But I also wanted just to lay a foundation and groundwork that could be beneficial for anybody. So even if you've not been here, hopefully you're not going to be lost. Um, I want to kind of pick up a little bit of what Simeon was saying. One of the philosophies that I, I believe is really important as a parent um, that you need to understand that you can have, uh, and I see, we see this in our current co homeschool co-op, you know, there's to ask why, what is, what is your reason, what is your goal, what's your mission as a parent? And this will tell you some things about the way that God parents us, right? He doesn't take us out of the world and, and call us to become uh, completely isolated from the world around us. Jesus never did that. He engaged it with the world, uh, many unbelievers and he had a community, a kingdom community that was living differently. So that's what come out and be separate means. It come out from among them. It means, uh, it means basically you live unto God, right? You don't have your heart entangled with the world system. But yet he, he says we're not of the world, but he leaves us in the world. Uh, so that, why? We can be a witness for Jesus, an ambassador of Jesus Christ. Uh, and so we, you have a choice about the way that you parent. Uh, a lot of parents have a very sort of protective uh, mindset, and there's times at, at the stages of growth of your children, your, your being their protector, that role sort of changes. What you're ultimately wanting to do is you're wanting to equip them so that they can have discernment, so that they can have uh, freedom uh, to live their own lives wherever the Lord may take them, but to be able to maintain a love for Jesus Christ and effectiveness for Him that will enable them to live godly and, and not be sucked in by the waves of the world. It's a really challenging thing uh, because we see in the homeschool co-op that we're a part of, there, there are families that their main motivation of, of homeschooling their children uh, is to keep them out of the public school system. You know, bad, bad, bad. And so their main motivation is fear. We're afraid of that. And so deep down in their heart, they believe that the world is more powerful than God. And all they have is, uh, is rules. That's bad, that's bad, that's bad, that's bad. And so it's mostly negativity that gets instilled into their children. Because even if you don't say it that way, the children pick up on the emotional vibes that are driving everything. <laughs> you know, if they can see that, you know, really we're trying to control your circumstances because we're afraid that that's way too powerful for you. But, um, and there's, a, there's an aspect to where you know, absolutely, you know, there, you have, you need to be a, a filter about the influences that come into your children's life. And those, those filters, though, need to, um, they're, they're going to adjust as your child grows in, uh, in maturity. Okay? Because you know that by the time they turn 18 years old, you are no longer the filter. Right? So they need to have internalized... Uh, something that is going to help them be completely free uh, from, from your personal influence. Your control is not going to be a part of their, their factor anymore. Um, and so I liken it to this. If you, if you can imagine, if you are as a family, if your house is near a river, you can make your children wear life vests and forbid them from ever going outside. Or you can teach them about the boundaries, about where it, when it's not good to be near the river. You can teach them how to swim at a young age, how to get to the side very quickly, 
right? So they know, they, they, they are able to handle it. So listen, the world out there is a raging river. And you, can, you need to be able to teach them, give them uh, some equipping that helps them to be able to live um, without your control, without you filtering everything for them. And I'm not saying that you, as parents, while their children are in your home, that you don't provide some filter, that you don't provide some, some, some boundaries, but at, as the children are growing, their freedom increases, and so their, their internal, uh, it needs to be internal. If, if, they're, if they don't shift from, I can't do this and I don't do this simply because my mom and dad say it, to this is mine, right? This is what I, this is what I see. So that, that whole, that whole uh, parenting process really requires that you have something more than just rules, it really does, because nobody falls in love with a rule. <laughs> Amen? I mean, you know, I just love this rule. There are some people like that. They're called legalists. They're called traditionalists. They're called Pharisees. And those are the people that think that it's their job to parent everybody else. <laughs> you're not allowed to do that. God says you're not supposed to. And they just get after everybody. And they're basically the enforcers. They communicate the rules and they're the enforcers. These were the people that killed Jesus. That's the spirit that of self-righteousness um, and that, that basically God, what he's mostly concerned about is whether you follow rules. But Jesus shifted everything and brought us into a heart-to-heart, face-to-face, spirit-to-spirit relationship with God so that no longer do we uh, live our lives following a list of rules, we live our lives, but we don't live our lives lawlessly. We live our lives ruled by a relationship. Right? So, Tina and I, we've been married almost 25 years. This Tuesday, we'll be married 25 years. Okay? I still, I'm in more in love with her now than I was the day that I married her. And I think she still likes me. <laughs> um, and so, uh, but I'll tell you, our marriage would not have gone anywhere if I was just living by the bare minimum of the requirements of the rules. You know, I mean, I'd really like to go after that other lady over there, but the rules say I can't. So, you know, I mean, that really just, in, you know, it just endears your heart to one another. Like, I'd like to just slap the fire out of you, but I'm, the rules say I can't hit you. <laughs> right. But it, what does it say about kicking? Uh, you know, <laughs> you know, I mean, that's the way that's the way people when all of their lives are just about governed by rules. They're always looking for loopholes around the rules, aren't they? Because deep down inside rules cannot change a person's heart. But the Holy Spirit and the presence of the Lord Jesus can change our hearts. He takes out of us a heart of stone, gives us a heart of flesh that's alive. Amen. He takes out of us an ungodly heart and puts into us the Spirit of God. Um, so how is it? And I see this transition uh, a lot. And one of the things that has made me aware of the difference between religion and the gospel is part of our background. Tina and I were missionaries to the Muslim world. And being in that environment, it made me very aware of religion in general. And then I started realizing how much religion has crept into Christianity. Um, and people have this mindset sometimes that God and religion are on the same team. They wear the same color jerseys. But the religion jersey and Jesus' jersey are completely different, right? Jesus is against religion and religion is against Jesus. 
And if we don't start to make distinctions about that, now, what am I talking about? Okay, well, you know, what, because you've got to define the word religion because there is a, uh, you know, this is a true, this is true religion to take care of widows and orphans and to keep yourself unstained by the world, right? So that's not the terms in which I'm using it, right? That's good stuff. But the religious thing would be, a supposed devotion to God and to godliness that did not come from heaven, right? It, there's no life in it. There's, there's no love in it. There's no true holiness in it. All there is is, is bad people trying to act like they're good, and trying to become good and trying by on the basis of, of a bunch of rules, okay? Think of it this way. In the religion of Islam, they have a book that they believe came from God, right? And they have rules, a list of things that are do's, a list of things that are don'ts, and there's a reward system. If you do the do's, you'll be blessed now, and you'll uh, hopefully get into heaven if Allah is in a good mood when your number comes up, uh, but you got, a, you got a decent shot at it, right? Uh, you can go to heaven. Uh, and then... If you don't do the do's and you do do the don'ts, say that ten times fast, you're, you're most likely going to go to hell unless Allah just decides he's just going to throw the rule book out and, you know, because there's a little bit of a whimsical nature of this whole thing. Nobody knows anything at the end of the day. It's a, it's a very sophisticated form of agnosticism, I believe. All right, so they've got a prophet of an example. What did Muhammad do? How did he go to the bathroom? How did he consummate his marriage? How did he uh, go eat his meal? How did he, you know, uh, wash his dishes? How did he go to war? You know, he, they've got all these rules and they're always trying to find what's the right way to do this. And I'm not kidding you. They have rules for absolutely everything. Uh, and all the things I just mentioned, I mentioned those because I was surprised. They've got rules about that. They've got rules about that. Oh, yeah, they've got rules about absolutely everything. Uh, and so I saw that, and I saw that there was decent people who sincerely just wanted to acknowledge the fact that they were created by someone else, and they were seeking to live a life that was pleasing to their Creator. And so I tell people this. I say, listen... Muslims, for the most part, are really good people. They're nice people. They're kind people. They're worthy of our respect, our love. Uh, Muslims are, are good people, but Islam is evil. It's just plain old evil because the more that good people pursue this and allow this, this teaching to get into their hearts and minds, it'll take a decent person and make them a conscienceless mass murderer. It just will because of the system itself, okay? So it's the lies and the deception and the, uh, uh, that, that we're against. So my question to us is, are you walking in Christ or are you just getting religious? Are you walking in Christ or are you just getting religious? What's the difference? And if, you don't, and if you don't know the difference, that's a scary place to be, especially since your community is religious. All right? Um, you know, the diff part, one of the differences is this, is that God in, in Islam and in Christianity, he, give, he has a book, right? But the book is different, all right? First of all, uh, let's look at this in John chapter 5. We see a huge one of the differences. John chapter 5. Verse 39. <clears throat> Jesus, Jesus was approached by some Pharisees. And he said to them, You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. Now, Jesus is now rebuking people for reading the Bible. 
How about that? Not just he, but he's not just rebuking them for, for reading the Bible. It was their mindset of how they were reading the Bible. So we need to understand there's a religious way of reading, a fleshly way of reading the Bible. That you can read the Bible to your blue in the face, and it's actually taking you further from God instead of bringing you closer to Him. So he said, you search the Scriptures because you think that in them you have life. You know what that means? You basically open the Bible and you're looking for what does God want me to do what, so that I can be blessed, so that I can live right, so that I can do the things He wants me to do. And, you know, uh, and what are the things He don't want me to do? So it's the do's and the don'ts and I've got a relationship with a book and I'm going to pull it off. I'm going to do the do's and don't do the don'ts and I'm going to improve. You know, nobody ever gets it completely right, but I'm going to try hard. You know what? When you try hard, you get really frustrated at the people who aren't trying as hard as you. And then you think, well, you know, they're having fun. What is this? That, that, don't, that don't, you know, they'll find something wrong with what you're doing. Because, you, you know, you got cell phones in your house. What the heck? You know, and, you know, your, 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 your wife isn't wearing a doily on her head. And, you know, and your, you know, your tractor tires have rubber on them. And, you know, they'll, they'll find some reason. To, and they'll define, according to their definition, you're worldly, you're ungodly. You know, they'll just make the rules. Because, you know why? They're trying hard to keep rules. And they never feel like they ever got there. How good is good enough? How devoted is devoted enough? How? Because they they're living out of this spirit of being an orphan, being a slave. Deep down inside, they know they don't have a, a connection with God. So there's no confidence. There's no peace. And there's just striving. Remember uh, Ishmael? It talks about him in, in Galatians chapter 4. It talks about him in Genesis. Ishmael was born first. He was the older brother, and he was born a slave, the son of a slave, wasn't he? And then uh, he persecuted the younger one. He was born of a promise. And, he, and the older one was always jealous because he wanted the favor of the father. He wanted to be the one that, that uh, got the inheritance. Uh, and Cain did the same thing with Abel, didn't he? God accepts your sacrifice and I wanted to you know, accept me. And so there's that frustration you know, that comes against people. It just provokes persecution because legalism can't stand freedom. <laughs> It can't. It can't stand. You got it by grace. You got it by the promise of God. You just believed a promise and you think that's enough. Wait a second. You can't just believe in Jesus and think that's enough. You need to, what did they say in Galatians? You need to get circumcised and embrace the entire law of Moses. Amen. Well, maybe people didn't come at you with circumcision in the law of Moses. Maybe they came at you with rules about cell phones and tractor tires. Right? Maybe they came at you with all kinds of other rules. And what I want to encourage you um, is that, if, that rules are not the way. <laughs> Even if they seem to have their finger on a Bible verse. Listen, Bible verses are like Lego pieces. How many of you have Legos at your house? Oh, I'm seeing lots of hands. Okay. You can build a lot of things with Lego pieces, right? But when those Legos come originally in a set, usually there's a picture of something on the box that this Lego set builds this thing. Uh, I remember one time I was uh, at a friend's house and we had done a Bible study and I had broken them up into partners like we did in one of our sessions. Uh, and I didn't have a partner, but there was one little kid who had brought a clear tin of Lego blocks and they were making stuff over in the corner. And uh, I couldn't figure out what she was making, but I looked in the pile and I saw uh, one with two rubber wheels and a little connector piece. And I found another one, two little wheels and a connector piece. And I put, slapped a long one in between them and started building it up. And I made something that looked kind of like a, a multicolored Batmobile. And I rolled it over to her and said, what do you think of that? And she said, well, that's not right. And she took it all apart and threw them all back in the pile. <laughs> How could she know that that isn't right? I mean, come on, it rolled. It didn't fall apart when it rolled. It looked like it held together. I enjoyed it. Um, 
And, but she said it wasn't right. You know how she could say it wasn't right? Because she knew what the cover on the box looked like. And so that was her grid that she could use to say, wait a second, that doesn't look like the cover on the box. So even though it holds together, it's not right. Do we have a cover on the box so that we can tell the difference between when people just put a few Bible verses together and it looks right, looks like it holds together versus, because you've got a lot of people talk, teaching all kinds of stuff out of the Bible, don't you? I mean, there's people who teach that you know, they go to protest these uh, funerals and, you know, and they hold these signs saying that God hates fags, right? And they hold these signs uh, that says, God killed your soldiers and he, you know, God hates America and all of these things. And they say, well, we've got Bible verses that prove that we're right. Are they right? Some of you are shaking your head no. Some of you are sitting there saying, well, I don't know. You know, we got some of them around here too. <laughs> I used to hold them signs. I got some out in my garage. <laughs> so, listen, let, let me ask you this. How do you know? How do you know? Because good intentioned people have a lot of, uh, uh, can go very wrong. Remember the Pharisees, they were all upset because Jesus was eating and drinking with sinners. They're like, you're not, you know, if you're a holy person, especially if you're a teacher, you know, I mean, the influence you have on this community, you are with the wrong crowd. And so, you know, they felt that it was their duty to show up at that dinner party and to call Jesus out. It's probably happened around here. It could. But Jesus said, listen, you've got a Bible verse to prove that these people are sinners, but you, you've missed the whole point. I've come to you to reveal God. I've come to, to eat and drink with sinners because they need repentance, right? I've came to call them to change their mind. In fact, I've come to call you to change your mind. Amen? So, how do you know? Jesus is the cover on the box. He is the Word made flesh. Amen? If it, so if it doesn't look like Jesus, if it doesn't walk like Jesus, if it doesn't talk like Jesus, if it doesn't help you to look like Jesus, walk like Jesus, talk like Jesus, then it's not right. If it doesn't look like the apostles and the way that they follow Jesus, as good as it may look, and they've got a bunch of Bible verses under their fingers, you know what? It just ain't right. Can I just tell you that? Now, it's important that we understand some things because there were some, thi there are some things that are biblical that aren't gospel. Amen? Do you understand the difference? There was a huge shift that took place when Jesus showed up on the planet. There was a huge shift that took place when Jesus died and rose again. Um, it says in John chapter 1 that the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth showed up through Jesus Christ. Amen? So the creation, according to Romans, reveals that God is creator, powerful, invisible, and wise. The law was given through Moses, but grace and truth showed up in Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter 1 says this, that God spoke in many portions and in many ways to our fathers. So in the Old Testament, you've got bits and pieces and portions. But in these last days, He's spoken to us in, spoken to us, spoken to us. In the, he did speak to our fathers, bits and pieces and portions. In these last days, He spoke to us in the Son. Amen? So He, he has self-revealed Himself and communicated Himself in fullness in Jesus. So sometimes people will say, well... You can't heal everybody, even in the Bible, everybody wasn't healed. Look at Job. You know what? The book of Job was in Jesus' Bible too. And he never went into a village and healed 99% of the people and said, I'm sorry, you're screwed, you're just like Job. <laughs> he didn't say that, did he? 
It was in his Bible. But he said, you know what? The law was given through Moses, but now grace and truth has arrived. I have arrived to show you the glory of God, uh, the fullness of my Father. Amen? That's good news. And do you know Jesus uh, not only uh, comes to show us the Father, but He actually comes to show us ourselves, the life that He lives inside of you and me? He does. Colossians chapter 3 verse 4 says, When Christ who is your life is revealed, you're going to be revealed with Him in glory. Now let me ask you this. If God says Christ is your life, what's your life? Christ. It doesn't matter how you feel about it or what you've been taught to think. You might think God looks at you and He's looking at all your lists of do's and don'ts. What if God isn't looking at that? What if God is actually looking at the Spirit of Jesus whom you've received, who's become one with you, and He says, that's who they really are. I can't wait for them to discover that. I can't wait for them to realize that the, the, Jesus Christ is everything I've ever wanted. And so when they received Him, they've got inside of them everything that all ever, I ever wanted to see in them. I mean, could you ever be more pleasing to God than Jesus? No. Could you ever add anything to what Jesus is? No. So why are you trying so hard to add to what Jesus has done? Why don't you just start discovering who lives inside of you and start believing in Him and embracing Him and loving Him and letting His Spirit and that love that He has with the Father, that faith He has towards the Father, govern your life. Amen. You know, Jesus didn't come to planet Earth hoping He could finally do enough to finally get back to heaven. He didn't. That's not how sons walk. He didn't start off with a, with a fear and rejection, did He? He started off completely accepted, and He brought that acceptance to the planet Earth. And then He died and rose again to break off of us all rejection and striving to get, make us born again. Now we're born again children of God, and so we start off completely accepted, perfectly loved, and God just wants us to be transformed by the renewing of our minds so that our mindset be, becomes aligned with His. Uh, sometimes as parents, uh, we... We, we can tell that our children aren't thinking right and they're not feeling right, you know, that they've got mindsets. My wife and I, we went through a failed adoption several years back, and we didn't set off to go through a failed adoption. We set off for adoption, right? And uh, what happened is we had adopted a little one-year-old African-American boy from Georgia. His name was Zion, um, and we brought him into our home. The birth mother's rights, they had the paperwork at all cleared on that. And so now, according to the state of Wisconsin, we had to wait six months uh, for the paperwork to clear Wisconsin. At the two-month point, I got a nervous phone call from the adoption agency in Georgia saying, Mr. Hayner, I'm sorry, there's a comp complication. The birth father is vigorously challenging this adoption. We had been told by the birth mother that the birth father was out of the picture and was not interested. Um, and in Georgia, that's all that was necessary. It turned out that the birth mother had lied. Okay. Now, I say all that just because I know I can't introduce part of a story without telling the whole thing. It, eventually, at three months, we had to give Zion back because, you know, you, you can't... We, it was never our intention to build our family at somebody else's expense. And if the birth mother had lied, as much as it broke our hearts, and it really did... Um, you know, it was the right thing to do to, to reunite Zion with his birth father and their family. So, um, but here's, here's the thing that was very interesting. That even at one year old, when Zion come into our home, we could tell he had a very strange relationship with food. There was an insecurity about him. To almost like, where's one time, honestly, we thought he was going to eat so much he was going to literally explode. Um, like we kept, just kept feeding him and we kept feeding him because we were like, how much does this kid eat? We were just trying to get to know him, you know. And, and then there was one spoonful of chopped up spaghetti in front of him. And I, we saw him do this, no kidding. He's looking at it and, and he's... And we're like, when's he going to get full? And he's going, <sighs> 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 how, 
you know, he's like psyching himself up. Like, I don't know if I can do this. Okay, I can do this. I can do this. I, you know, he's getting, like, and, and then we're like, okay, that's it, you know. And we're like, why does this kid eat like that? And we started realizing he might have been in a situation where he didn't always get to eat. So when he did get to eat, he just gorged, you know. There was an insecurity. Maybe I'm not going to have uh, as much around the next time. There were other things like that. But as here's the thing that you need to understand. What he believed about his state wasn't the truth. He was in our home. In our home, children eat. And so if he believed he, he may or may not eat... Can someone pull that? Sorry. Um, if he believed that he may or may not eat then that's going to affect the way that he interacts with the world, right? Jesus said, I will not leave you as orphans, but I will come to you. So that means, here's, hear me now, how, is he, how does he come to us in that context? John chapter 14, I will not leave you as orphans, but I will come to you. Yes, I'm going to send to you the helper, the Holy Spirit. So hear, hear me that we need to learn to be fathered by the Holy Spirit. We need to learn to receive the truth of God in our hearts because the truth that's in the Word needs to be in our hearts. It needs to be internalized. See, Jesus went through this transition. He was with the, the disciples, and He was the leader that they looked to, and, and He protected them when He was with them. But He said, now I'm going to leave, but I'm going to shift things from me being with you to, to everything that I've got inside of me being inside of you. This is the job that we've got as parents, but this is the same job that God the Father does, doesn't He? He's with us and He leads our life and gets us pointed the right direction. But His main thing is, I'm teaching you certain things, but then He did something amazing. I'm putting the Spirit that's in me inside of you. And so we need to develop our relationship with the Holy Spirit. Amen? We need to have the Holy Spirit saturating our hearts and our minds uh, so that we can learn to experience the Father like this, Jesus experienced the Father. Amen. So Jesus says, He goes on to say in, in John chapter 5, verse 39, I'm still preaching the Word, you know, kind of anchoring it here for a little bit. You search the Scriptures because you think that them, in them you have eternal life. It's these that testify about me, and you are unwilling to come to me so that you may have life. What is he saying? These scriptures are not a rule book. These scriptures are testifying of me. And so the scriptures were given to you to reveal a person. So that now you can come to me personally. I want a relationship with you. I want you to come to me so that you might have life. Now this isn't just come to Jesus so that you go to heaven when you die. This is the scriptures show you who I am so that you personally can come to me, encounter me, fellowship with me, and that the life that's in me the life that I brought from out of eternity, the life that shoots out of me and heals a sick person and shoots out of me and casts out a demon and shoots out of me and raises a dead person, that life that makes me glow like a light bulb on the top of a mountain, that life that gives me access to the presence of God and to uh, hearing Him and seeing Him and Him being real in me, and, and empowering me to be a living demonstration of the reality of God with you. You can have that life inside of you when you come to me. So we teach our children and, and we teach ourselves to be very Christ-centered. That It's about a relationship with Him and having the life that's in Him inside of us. Disciplining ourselves to that life. 
that sometimes we're like, ooh, that wasn't Jesus. <laughs> Jesus doesn't think that way. Jesus doesn't feel that way. And so what do you do? Do you just condemn yourself with a bunch of lists of rules? No, you say you have discernment now. That's not Jesus. What do you do? Do you just beat yourself up? Oh, God's not excited. No, you know what? Everything that, that is not Jesus about us, God crucified 2,000 years ago. He's like totally not even thinking about that anymore. He could not care. It is finished. Praise God. And so he brings it to our attention so that he can see that was not life. That wasn't my son so that we can do what? Put off the old man. We don't try to improve that person. You can never get your carnal mind to become a believer. <sighs> you won't. You'll never get your flesh to live godly. The best your flesh can do is to keep, try to keep rules and get either really proud when it thinks it's doing okay or get really frustrated and discouraged when it's not doing so well. But when you put all of that off and say, you know what? I'm not striving to try to get, get the favor of God. I receive as a gift the same favor that Jesus has, the same righteousness that Jesus has, the same standing with the Father that Jesus has, the same spirit that Jesus has. And I'm just going to live in this. <laughs> now I get to just swim down the river. You know, I, this, is, this is not hard. The river does the work. Amen. But we just... Stay in it. Praise God. Okay? Now, so this should impact the way that we have quiet times, right? So when you're reading the scriptures, instead of, okay, what is this rule and what's that rule and what's that rule and what's that rule, be careful. That's the wrong mindset. What you need to say is, how does this show me the life of Christ, the fullness of God that's in Christ? And so that you can worship Him. So now you're, you're reading a menu, right? You, who goes into a restaurant? Some of you guys don't ever go to restaurants, but who goes into a restaurant? <laughs> who goes into a restaurant and just reads the menu? I mean, if you're going to go to the restaurant, you don't just read the menu. You don't just memorize the menu and then say, boy, that was a great restaurant. You order from the menu. And then you taste and see that the food is good. Amen? <laughs> and the word in the scriptures points us to the living word, the Lord Jesus, the very person, so that we can come to him personally. When you come to him personally, are you just praying religious prayers like God's way up there and your way down here and that sort of thing? Or are you opening up your heart to speak to the Father as a son? in union with Jesus Christ. A lot of us pray very unlike Jesus. We think of God up here and Jesus next to him and ourselves way down here, right? We need to fix that. Galatians chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4. Uh, Galatians chapter 4, verse 4. But when the fullness of time came, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under law, so that He might redeem those who were under the law. Now, why does, what, what is redemption? Why does God send Jesus to redeem us? What's He trying to do? Okay. Any, any ideas? Bring us back. Bring us back? Okay. Perfect. Back to what? Or to our original state. Okay. Good. Sounds like y'all had some good teaching before. <laughs> All right. A lot of times people talk about redemption and it's really Jesus redeemed us so that we don't have to go to hell. So that we can go to heaven when we die. But look at this. He, redeems means he's paying a price to buy us back. Right? So... If God pays the price for you, according to Him, you're worth the price He pays, right? Yep. Yes, we are. So, everyone in here 
God is saying to you through the cross, you're worth dying for. You're worth dying for. On your worst day, on your worst day, when you were a law-breaking sinner, didn't care anything about doing my will, you are worth dying for. Your problem is you don't know how much you are worth to me. Right? And so God is declaring this to us, that we're worth dying for. But look why, why He redeemed us. He redeemed those who were under the law so that we might receive the adoption as sons. Wow! Jesus is paying adoption fees. He's paying the price so that He can sever any claim from anyone ever jerking you out of the home of God. Amen? You're never going to have to go through failed adoption. Guess what? You can get an orphanage, or an orphan out of the orphanage, but it's another thing to get the orphanage out of the orphan. Amen? You understand that? That sometimes kids pick up things as an orphan that they bring into their home because when they were an orphan, nobody really loved them. When they were an orphan, they were the only ones who had to take care of themselves. When they were an orphan, they didn't have abundance of resources and abundance of love. They had to just scheme to get by from day to day to day, right? And people weren't relationships. They were tools that I could get what I need for the next day, right? They would just use them. But, but that's not the way the father thinks. That's not the way he raises his children. You are created in my image to be mine forever. And I've adopted you and given you the same relationship with me that Jesus has. And also, I've put the same spirit inside of you that Jesus has. So how do you pray from the spirit of the Son? Because he, it says, because you are sons, He's put the spirit of His Son into your heart, crying, Abba, Father. Amen? Do you ever just realize that prayer is not you talking to God way out there? It's actually God sending forth the Spirit of His Son into your heart so that the Spirit of His Son can pour through your heart and through your mind back to the Father. This is what's been going on in the eternal realm between the Father and the Son for all eternity. The Father loving the Son and pouring out His love in one spirit. The Son receiving the Father's love and the joy and the pleasure of the Father. Just being in the Father's presence, being loved, accepted, and letting that pour into Him. Receiving that and just reverberating it back. I love you with all the love I've received from you. I love you back. And this is just a love exchange. It's getting so amazing. They're like, ah. Oh, Let's make image bearers who can join in. Let's, let's adopt more. <laughs> you know? And, and the son knows that the father's so delighted in him, what would really please his heart is more of me. <sighs> and so what does the father do? He makes a way for us to participate in him. Now, we're not, there's not like he's producing Jesus number two, number three, number four, but there's one Jesus, but we get to partake of him. We get to, like, like a dam in a river, he puts all of these dams in the river. We're all adopted, so we all get to let the Spirit of the Son pour through our turbines. Amen? And wash through us and fill us with the same joy that Jesus has, the same peace that Jesus has. Now it begins to make sense. My peace I give to you. My joy I leave with you. No man can take this from you. And that same spirit of living in that, that's not striving. A river's not striving to flow. Yeah. Uh, fire isn't trying hard to finally get hot. So we need to learn that God has put a new nature inside of us. It is the nature of the Son to love the Father. It's the nature of the Son to love others. Why? Now, I want to tie this in with healing and then we'll be done. Okay? Can I, it, 
I think you're with me. All right. Go to Matthew chapter 17. Because this is going to hit on something that I think sometimes people have sincere questions about, especially when it comes to healing. Uh, Matthew 17, verse 1, it says, Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, his brother, and led them up on a high mountain. And he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun. His garments became white as light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it's good for us to be here. Actually, I started way too far up in this chapter. So Jesus gets transfigured. Then he comes down, which is uh, verse 14. It says, When they came to the crowd, a man came up to Jesus, falling on his knees before him, saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is lunatic and very ill, for he often falls into the fire and into the water. And I brought him to your disciples, and they could not cure him. Jesus answered and said, You unbelieving and perverted generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring him here to me. Jesus rebuked him, and the demon came out of him, and the boy was cured at once. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately. Why could we not drive it out? And he said to them, Because of the littleness of your faith, for truly I say to you, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you'll say to this mountain, Move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. But this kind does not come out except by prayer and by fasting. Now, if you look in a lot of translations, it has that in brackets or italics or has a little footnote, verse 21. This kind does not come out by prayer and by fasting. Um, a lot of people believe that that was something that was added in later manuscripts. It wasn't part of what Jesus originally said. I happen to agree with that because Jesus was uh, rebuked for, why don't your disciples fast, right? And he said, they can't fast while I'm with him, right? But if you look in Mark's gospel, it does say, Jesus says, this kind come out only by prayer. So, here's the cool thing about it. That, so we know what Jesus' answer is. He's, he's looking at them, and they're saying, Lord, why couldn't we see the results that you see? And Jesus came down. Did Jesus expect that the disciples should have got the boy free? Yes. How do we know that? Because he rebuked them. He did, right? So he rebuked them because something was, was amiss. Now, I want, I want you to step back for a second. Was it the will of God for this boy to be free? Yes. It was the will of God for this boy to be free. How do we know that? Because Jesus set him free. Jesus does the will of God. And so if you want to know what the will of God is, look at Jesus. Stop looking at your circumstances. Some people say, well, if it was the will of God, they'd have been healed. Sometimes Jesus came down from the mountain and he was frustrated because the will of God hadn't taken place. Okay? All right. So we know it was the will of God. Jesus had authorized and empowered the disciples to be able to set the boy free. So it was the will of God. The disciples had the power and the authority to do it, but yet it didn't happen. Now, had that situation taken place in a modern day church uh, before Jesus was able to come down from the mountain, they'd have come up with all kind of theories about why this boy wasn't getting set free especially the disciples, because they would have been teachers looked to. And so they'd have come up with a good biblical explanation. And they'd have taught it as a doctrine. They'd have put them little Batmobile car, and they'd have rolled it out there. And everybody go, ooh, yeah, that looks good. It holds together. Yeah, they got this verse, this verse. They connect. They would say, well, this kid was just like Job. Or they would say, God is doing a great ministry through this father to other parents who have children who are afflicted. Or they would say that this ch child was under a generational curse and we haven't figured out how to break those generational curses until the father repents of the sins of the great great grandfather uh, or they'd have come up with it just wasn't God's time but you know they'd have come up with all kinds of things wouldn't they and they'd have all sounded biblical and then Jesus shows up and just goes <laughs> takes them all apart throws it back in the pile and says that ain't right watch I'm the cover on the box this is what the will of God looks like <laughs> amen all right so that's what we need to fix our eyes on. 
But how do we grow from the difference of seeing that and believing that and actually seeing the will of God done in our lives through us, right? Because I believe this, I teach this, but yet is everybody that I pray for instantaneously, completely, miraculously healed? No. No. I, I'll tell you that. I, I never have claimed that. Watch my videos over and over. I tell the truth. Uh, I live with integrity before God and before men. Uh, I tell people, look, everybody that I pray for does not get healed instantly, but I didn't come here to give you my ministry. I came here to give you the ministry of Jesus. Amen. My ministry don't look too good. His ministry is amazing. <laughs> and I've learned the more I just get out of the way and, and, and let Jesus flow through me, that there is a... Uh, he still does what He does. Amen? Now... So the question then is, how do we move past failure to see the full fruit of the kingdom manifest in any situation? How do we increase? We talked some about this last night, about, about forgetting what lies behind uh, and reaching forward to what lies ahead, about just staying on that path of faith and obedience, about uh, holding the seed of the kingdom in an honest and good heart with perseverance, right? Because sometimes the fruit will come when the perseverance is there. Uh, about not getting up in your carnal mind about stuff. Uh, so that was a good message. Sorry, some half of y'all weren't even here. I can't recover the whole thing. But those were kind of some of the main points. But here's, here's what I want on the positive. Jesus said, this kind comes out only by prayer. What kind of prayer? This is not praying for God to take demons out because that's never how he ever cast a demon out. Never in his life. Nobody in the New Testament ever said, no, pray, God, please cast this demon out. He commanded us to cast the demon out, right? Prayer is for getting unbelief out. <laughs> prayer is for getting unbelief out. But it's what prayer means to Jesus. It's not just saying, oh God, please help my unbelief. No, that was a prayer in the Bible, but Jesus never prayed that. Jesus spoke to the Father and was in the presence of the Father as a son. That's what made the difference. Jesus is like, this kind isn't going to come out just because you say the right words. Just because you act the right way. Jesus said, this kind is only coming out when it's real in you. When it's real inside of you. And so that's where I encourage people, you take the Word of God and you go into the presence of God and you fellowship with God. I thank you, Father, that you are the Lord, my God, who heals me, who heals. It is your very nature. I thank you, Father, that you dwell inside of me, that you are a river flowing through me and that all of the power that's in the river flows through me. This, the, these kinds of things that we've been talking about. You take the sermons that you've been listening to from Curry Blake and Dan Moeller and Todd White and myself and other people like that, and you make them your prayer life. You look at the Word of God and the things that Jesus says to the Father and the things that God says about you. Thank you, Father, that Christ is my life. That when He appears, I will appear with Him in glory. And all the glory that the Father has given to the Son, the Son has given to us. Wow. People are going to be like, what's that big ball of fire? They're going to say, it's Jesus and Andy. <laughs> and Glenn <laughs> and Eldon, you know. <laughs> it's going to be amazing because they won't know where His glory stops and ours begins because guess what? His glory isn't His glory. His glory is the glory of the Father. And my glory isn't my glory. It's the glory of the Father that's in Jesus that's in me. Amen? Amen. Amen. So I want to encourage you, brothers and sisters, don't stop and start beginning to doubt and have unbelief based on circumstances not changing. If circumstances haven't changed and lined up to the full manifestation of the kingdom, 
go into the kingdom, into the presence of the king, and absorb that radioactive material that's in the presence of God until you start glowing like a light bulb. <laughs> Amen? So that, you, so that you walk by and people get x-rayed. <laughs> Amen? That's, that is... That means not just plugging in to faith because you have a crisis that you need to handle. This is a lifestyle of living as a son. Amen? Okay. So, we're here this morning and I know that there's people that probably would like some ministry uh, either for prayer, uh, for healing, or that you have a desire for just a fresh touch from God. Uh, maybe somebody to pray over you, um, that sort of thing. Um, so if you're here and you are part of the conference so far, um, you can choose how you want to participate. But I'm going to ask that I have some help as a ministry team. So if you're here and would like to be part of praying for people who request prayer for healing, or if you just want, hey, would you just pray over me and see if God gives you any words of encouragement? We learned about that yesterday. We had some great uh, time to pray over one another other as partners and God just did some really amazing things so this is not a selfish thing this isn't like an altar call like everybody's gonna be going like oh I wonder what they've been up to you know it's nothing like that uh, this is an opportunity for us while we're together to to really just bless one another so I'm gonna stop the message here with a prayer a general prayer over everybody uh, and you all are free to you know begin to fellowship and Glenn do you have anything before we finish Right. Do you want to give some? Le so after after Glenn gives whatever instructions he gives, um, then I'm going to come back up. And if I can have people who want to help be part of the ministry team to come up and help. And then if you'd like some prayer, there's going to be people up here ready to pray. Uh, and then if you want to just uh, break up and go fellowship, that's fine too. Okay. Uh, that way there's you know no eyes. You, know, you don't have to worry about being in front of people. It's just a nice, relaxed thing. And then we'll see you at the park for lunch. There's a, there's a potluck, uh, blessing, lunch sort of thing. I don't, think they, I don't think it's legal to call it potluck around here probably, right? Because we don't believe in luck. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, it's a, it's a, gra yeah, it's a grace gift lunch. <laughs> uh, and, then, uh, and then tonight we have a healing miracle service tonight at 7 o'clock. So if you know people that need healing, uh, yeah, yeah, you go ahead and reach out to them, invite them, uh, see if they'll, they'll come. Okay, thank you very much. I hope this was helpful for you. Father, I thank you for the word that was sown. I thank you for the good soil that is here. And I ask, Lord, let this word really sink deeply into our heart. Thank you that you want to father us by the Holy Spirit. And so, Holy Spirit, your ministry is to guide us into this truth so that it's not just truth that we know, that we understand, but truth that we walk in, that lives in us. And so I ask in the name of Jesus, Father, that you would uh, seal this word in your children's hearts. Help them to learn to experience life as a son, life in the son, that Christ would grow up in them. In Jesus' name, amen.